Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm sorry I can't make it there in person tonight, but I hope that you enjoy my talk and uh, find it informative and interesting to listen to. Right, so artificial intelligence and Parkinson's disease. I'll be covering both topics in this talk and hopefully you get an idea about what my research is about and why we're so interested in it. To start off, we need to explore what Parkinson's disease actually is. Parkinson's, or PD as I might accidentally call it throughout the talk, is a progressive incurable neurological disorder. It's the second most common neurological disability in the world after Alzheimer's dementia, and it's the most rapidly increasing. Parkinson's has a whole host of symptoms associated with it. We simplify this a bit by referring to them as non-motor and motor symptoms. Non-motor symptoms range from more physical symptoms like low blood pressure and constipation to more mental symptoms like depression and anxiety. Arguably, more crucial to Parkinson's, however, are the motor symptoms. These are problems with your ability to move about in the world. The three major symptoms we think about with Parkinson's are bradykinesia, which is a slowing down and sometimes complete stopping of movement, tremor or shakiness, and finally, rigidity or stiffness. There are theories around what causes Parkinson's to occur, but there's been no conclusive agent identified that initiates the disease. What we do know is that eventually it causes destruction of the part of the brain that produces dopamine, known as the substantia nigra, or black substance. And this loss of dopamine causes the motor symptoms I mentioned. So how do we diagnose Parkinson's? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we consider the motor symptoms to be more fundamental to the disease although thorough research is going into what I call prodromal symptoms or symptoms that can indicate that Parkinson's may develop. In order to be diagnosed with Parkinson's, you must display that slowing down of movement, bradykinesia, plus one or both of the other two symptoms, tremor and rigidity. Once diagnosed, because the disease is progressive and incurable, we need ways to monitor how people are doing. Some people's symptoms may progress rapidly while others slowly, so it's useful to keep track of that. There are different assessment tools that provide part of the picture. For example, something known as a mocha or cognitive assessment can indicate signs of dementia, or the hernan yar scale, which is used to stage the functional impairment caused by Parkinson's. However, there's one scale that attempts to condense all of the elements of Parkinson's together. This is known as the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, or UPDRS, and is a crucial component of research into Parkinson's disease. It is considered the gold standard for monitoring the severity and progression of symptoms. So what's so good about it? It provides very clear instructions to the, both the patient and the scorer as to how it needs to be answered. This makes it reliable even across different raters for one patient or the same rater at different times. The UPDRS has also made an attempt at making the scoring of the symptoms objective. Each symptom is rated from zero to four, zero meaning that the individual is not affected by that symptom and a four meaning it's completely disabling. And there are very clear definitions of each score. So if it's so good, what's the issue? Well, the UPDRS we use today is actually a revision of the original that sought to improve upon it. Instructions were made clearer and the scores were more easily applicable. It was improved upon because the more accurately we can assess someone's symptoms, the better we can help them. And there are still flaws with the UPDRS. Most important to my research is that the scoring, no matter how clear, still relies on human judgment. Take tremor, for example. A tremor with an amplitude of one to three centimeters is considered mild, whereas a tremor of three to 10 centimeters is considered moderate. If I were there in person, I could demonstrate this, but it's very difficult and thus subjective to make that distinction in some cases, especially when it is right on the border of two scores. And this is the case with a lot of scoring. So if humans are the problem, then it's only natural for us to turn to artificial intelligence and computer vision. 
Computer vision is the field of artificial intelligence that enables computer systems to extract meaningful information from digital media like videos or pictures. By training an artificial intelligence system to recognize the movements seen in Parkinson's, we can eliminate the subjectivity that humans bring to the table and characterize symptoms more accurately. There are other ways to capture motion. For example, you can use magnets uh, to accurately track movement. However, this is clunky, expensive, and requires expertise in its usage. All forms of motion tracking have their impediments, and most interfere with the motion that's being tracked. The beauty of computer vision is that it is what we call markerless motion capture, i.e. the patient doesn't need to be interfered with in order to catch their movements, and it can all be done using a simple smartphone camera. I'm going to show you a short video of a man tapping his fingers, and then we can work through the process a little bit more and find out what I'm actually talking about. So this man is doing one of the tasks from the UPDRS known as finger tapping. What we see in the video is a change in the amplitude of his taps over the course of the video. That's called decrement in amplitude and is a sign of bradykinesia, that all important symptom of Parkinson's disease. But what do we do with that video? So we have an artificial intelligence motion capture software known as Deep Lab Cut. We train Deep Lab Cut to be able to recognize in that video some key points, namely the man's wrist and the base and tip of his thumb and index finger. But what do I mean when I say we train it? This report relies upon two principles in AI. Firstly, transfer learning. When we look at things in the world, all we see is meaning. When a computer is presented with an image, all that it is receiving is thousands of coordinates with an associated numerical value. Computer vision is the process of identifying patterns in those assortments of numerical values that represent meaningful real world things. It takes humans many years to establish all of that meaning when we look at things, and it's much the same with AI. It can take weeks, months, or even years to effectively recognize patterns. It would be unfeasible to do that every time we wanted to teach a system to do what we want it to. To get around that, networks are often pre-trained on enormous online image databases in pattern recognition. One such database, ImageNet, has over 14 million pictures and is what Deep Lab Cut draws on. Transfer learning is the process by which a network has saved data related to one task and then is repurposed for another similar task. This cuts our training time down from potentially years to the few hours it took to train for this task. So if transfer learning is what makes teaching AI feasible, we still don't know what, how they're actually doing the learning, right? And that's where deep learning comes into play. Deep learning is a process of machine learning that attempts to mimic the functions of a brain. It takes an input, feeds it through a network of hidden layers, each slightly altering the input to come to an output. Much the same way that individual neurons all receive information from our eyes, integrate it with other pieces of information and produce a meaningful image in our head. That output is then compared against the desired output to close the gap between what we want it to spit out and what it actually does. This continues for thousands of iterations until the system is reliably recognizing body parts of interest. All it takes is for me to point out the points of interest and occasionally correct the system when it gets it wrong, something we call refinement. When we're happy with it, we get something like the following video. As you can see, our AI has successfully recognized the points I mentioned earlier. The blue lines connecting all the dots are known as a skeleton, and it just helps keep our AI on track. So what is the result of that? Well, each image consists of thousands of pixels, and the locations of those points are stored as coordinates in those pixels. We can take those coordinates and plot them on a graph over time, like you see here. This graph shows the distance between the index finger and thumb over time. As you can see, the distance increases and decreases cyclically as the man opens and closes his fingers. What information does that give us? We can extract relative measures from it. 
we can see how many times he tapped his fingers and convert that into a frequency. We can see the size of his finger tapping decreasing over time with the amplitude of the taps at the end, almost exactly half the amplitude of those at the beginning. We can also see some irregular irregularities throughout the taps, the squiggles and the, the peaks. As we improve the system, we'll be able to determine if those irregularities are tremor superimposed on his finger tapping or a result of freezing during the taps or something else. What we can't do yet is take absolute measurements, like the exact number of centimeters he is opening his fingers to, because it's very difficult to determine exactly how far away and how large an object is in an image. This is where this funny looking picture comes into play. This is known as a checkered augmented reality board from the University of Cordoba. Quite a mouthful, so it's referred to as a Churuco board. The dimensions of each of these squares are known and easily recognized by computer vision. So when incorporated into the videos we take, we can calculate exactly how far away and how large a subject is. With that information known, we can then calculate the absolute measures of their movement. Once we have those measures, we can feed them back into our severity scores to get more precise information about a patient. And our hope is to eventually implement this research in things like drug trials to improve patient treatment or use it for long distance monitoring in a world stricken by pandemic lockdowns. Um, I'm just about out of time. So I will uh, say goodbye there and I hope that piques your interest. Um, and thank you very much for listening to my talk.